The months, weeks, days and hours draw closer and closer to May 25th, 2019. On that date, All Elite Wrestling officially sets its feet on the ground, hosting their very first event of any sort. It just so happens that the event, Double or Nothing, will be a pay-per-view emanating from the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. Much of the buzz surrounding Double or Nothing, as well as AEW in general, comes from the fact that for the first time since TNA was at its most viable, there's a worthy large-scale alternative to the WWE status quo. But Cody, Kenny, and the Bucks are far from the first enterprising wrestling minds to take steps into the pay-per-view market, obviously. Over the past 30 years, other organizations, some of which were fly-by-nights and one-offs, broadcast their own pay-per-view offerings, mostly to little or no success. Some of these events were so obscure that anyone ordering them via phone probably got a confused response from the customer service rep at their cable provider. We are sure that All Elite Wrestling and their best laid plans for Double or Nothing and beyond are going to be a rousing success and won't meet the same fate as the events listed here. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic.com and these are 10 debut pay-per-views that didn't go well. Number 10, AWA Super Clash 3. In December 1988, the American Wrestling Association followed WWE and NWA's footsteps into the pay-per-view arms race, bringing their third Super Clash to the medium. However, the AWA was in an ongoing decay by this time, having lost many of its viable talents like Hulk Hogan, Kurt Hennig, Jesse Ventura, Bobby Heenan, and others to WWE in the preceding years. The original Super Clash drew over 20,000 fans to Chicago's Comiskey Park, but this incarnation only brought in less than 10% of that to the Windy City's UIC Pavilion. As for the event itself, which was essentially a joint venture between AWA, World Class, Memphis's CWA and others, the wrestling wasn't the worst ever. Jerry Lawler and Kerry Von Erich's AWA and World Class title unification match was pretty good, despite a brutal screw job ending. But the event felt second rate and did nothing to aid AWA's ailing fortunes. Keeping on to the low quality was the fact that Vern Gagne reportedly didn't pay the provided wrestlers, including Lawler, who broke ties with the company company shortly after. About the only positive is that the event marked early national exposure for the likes of Diamond Dallas Page, Jeff Jarrett, Ivory, and Mick Foley. Number 9, UWF Beach Brawl. In 1990, a rather eccentric fellow named Herb Abrams founded his version of the Universal Wrestling Federation. In its existence, the UWF had syndicated television and played home to a litany of aging stars of the 1980s, as well as rising cult figure Cactus Jack. Mostly, however, UWF felt low rent, a borderline home movie version of what WWE had become. This was quite evident in the event's lone pay-per-view, Beach Brawl, in June 1991. In front of a mere 550 fans in Florida, Abrams trotted out familiar faces like Bam Bam Bigelow, Bob Backlund, Dr. Death, Steve Williams, Paul Laundorf, and others. So, to be fair, the roster was actually decent. But nonsensical booking, like a countout ending to a street fight, as well as a Lou Albano interview segment that ended abruptly, only made UWF feel like more of a lowbrow outfit. If holding a pay-per-view is meant to add prestige and credibility to a wrestling promotion, it would seem that UWF Beach Brawl did the exact opposite here. Number 8, LPWA Super Ladies Showdown. When Stephanie McMahon declared that WWE Evolution was the first all-women's wrestling pay-per-view in history, older fans nearly stumbled over their own two feet in order to cry BS. More than a quarter century previously, the Ladies Professional Wrestling Association, which was founded in 1989, held its own event in Rochester, Minneapolis in February 1992 in front of a scant 400 fans. So while Stephanie's statement was factually challenged, in fairness, it's not like Super Lady Showdown made such a lasting impression. Since ignoring history, is the order of the day, it was appropriate that the Glamour Girls wrestled on the card, since WWE ignores their existence when calling Sasha Banks and Bayley the first ever women's tag team champions. Other notables such as Terry Power, the future Tory in WWE, as well as Rockin' Robin took part in the show, and Super Lady Showdown proved to be the only pay-per-view for LPWA, which folded shortly after. Women's wrestling, however, has come a long way in the decade since, evidenced by the acclaim that Evolution has received. Number 7, XWF in your face. After the demise of WCW as well as ECW in 2001, a giant crater existed on the wrestling landscape and various individuals saw opportunity via attempts to fill it. The following year gave us long-lasting companies in Ring of Honor and TNA, but before then there were some duds. Take for instance the Excitement Wrestling Federation, that's excitement with an 
with an X. A Florida-based promotion that ran tapings in Orlando, hoping to score a TV deal. Hulk Hogan, Kurt Hennig, Roddy Piper, The Road Warriors, and Jerry Lawler during his WWE exit in 2001 were among the stars that XWF had to offer. Within months, thanks to the defection of some of the bigger names, plus the inability to score a TV deal, the XWF folded. More than a year after its premature closure, however, a series of matches from the tapings were thrown together for the one-off pay-per-view In Your Face, which ran in March 2003. A mishmash that included Hennig vs. Vampiro and Buff Bagwell vs. Big Vito, plus a lengthy promo from Piper and Sable, filled the compressed event, which didn't exactly resurrect the rotting vessel. Number 6. WOW Unleashed The women of wrestling promotion returned to broadcast TV in 2019 with a new cast of characters with Tessa Blanchard, Santana Garrett, Jessica Havoc, and others in a variety of broadly drawn roles that call back to Glow, as well as the earlier form of WOW at the turn of this century. It was the prior version of David McLean's WOW that occupied syndicated time slots with similar cheerful campiness and even spawned its own pay-per-view. WOW Unleashed took place in February 2001, and it was more of the same, gimmicks taking precedence over substance and, if you have discriminating tastes, a whole lot of not-so-good wrestling. To its credit, the event, which even had Bobby Heenan as guest commentator, drew a very impressive crowd to the Great Western Forum, but poor action, worse production, and most critically a low buy rate doomed an already fading promotion. WOW's production ceased prior to its tended follow-up, Spring Vengeance, slated for the week after WrestleMania 17. The world was just going to have to learn to live without the exploits of Sandy and Summer, the Beach Patrol. Number 5. I Generation Superstars of Wrestling, Rodman Down Under If ever an event needed a Vince McMahon spur-of-the-moment name shortening, this would be the one. In the year 2000, a group of longer-in-the-tooth stars of yesteryear, plus famed basketball star slash total head case Dennis Rodman, came together for a pay-per-view event that drew about 10,000 fans in Sydney, Australia. It's unclear whether the enterprise was ever intended to survive past one event, but if it was, there was going to need to be a bit of an overhaul. Picking the best match of this show is like figuring out which cat turd in the litter box smelled the best. Do you start with the 16-minute match between One Man Gang and Tatanka? Or the hardcore match that pitted Barbell? against Brute Force. The main event pitted Rodman against a post-WCW Kurt Hennig and was thankfully relegated below 9 minutes. Try as he could on commentary, Ted DiBiase just couldn't make his kayfabe era colleagues' performances feel anything less than clunky and dated. Number 4. WWA Inception Like the aforementioned XWF, World Wrestling All-Stars sought to occupy the WCW-sized hole in the wrestling landscape and scraped up much of the big names that WWE hadn't subsequently signed, assembling some tours outside the United States. Helmed by Australian music promoter Andrew McManus, WWA really did feel like a poor man's WCW, as the roster was filled with decent talents, but poor production was a major weakness. Their first pay-per-view, entitled Inception, was taped in October 2001 and aired the following January. Bret Hart appeared as commissioner, while Jeff Jarrett, Road Dogg, Conan, Hoovy, and others wrestled in the tournament to crown the first champion. Dumb comedy such as the inclusion of the bananas in pyjamas offset some quality action, including a Devon Storm vs Norman Smiley hardcore match that was pretty damn fun. Overall, Inception was not a bad show, and four pay-per-views would follow from the short-lived promotion, including their lone US event, Revolution. That said, the low-rent feel was hard to shake, and too many notable talents defected to WWE and TNA for the promotion to really have legs. Number 3. NWA Starcade 1987 Jim Crockett was following Vince McMahon in the potentially lucrative pay-per-view game when he brought Thanksgiving Night Starcade into the fold in 1987. Previous incarnations had proven to be excellent events, from the stacked 1985 simulcast to an equally loaded 1986 showcase. The 1987 event was the first pay-per-view foray, but was met with some creative resistance by McMahon. Namely, Vince McMahon invented Survivor Series and hosted it on the same night as a way of forcing an ultimatum onto cable companies. Fearing they'd be left out of WrestleMania 4, the near majority sided with Vince. The restricted market that did get Starcade were left with a show that was considerably down quality-wise from the previous few. Moving the event from Greensboro to a more mainstream Chicago didn't sit well with the Crockett Loyalist fans either. As for the card itself, it alternated between decent fare and below-average showings for much of the night, not the strongest representation of the impressive roster. Soon after, what became WCW began churning out excellent events like the most of the 1989 fair, but their first step wasn't exactly a firm stomp, more of an apprehensive skid. Number 2. The Wrestling Classic Oh, we were not going to let McMahon off so easy here. It's certainly true 
true that over the past three and a half decades that the WWE pay-per-view library has teamed with treasured gems, but there have been some clunkers for sure. WrestleMania 1 was not an official pay-per-view in the academic sense, so WWE's first venture into that market was November 1985's Wrestling Classic, which promised a one-night 16-man tournament and a world title match pitting Hulk Hogan against Rowdy Roddy Piper. No matches went beyond 10 minutes, and the tournament itself was a mess. You had matches that ended with wrestlers counting their own pins, tricking themselves into getting counted out, ending via stoppage when a guy gets crotched, and the eventual babyface winner, Junkyard Dog, getting a buy into the finals before winning the tournament by countout. Hogan vs Piper was decent, and any tournament match featuring Randy Savage or Ricky Steamboat is nice while it lasts, but WWE still had a lot to learn about how to make a pay-per-view good. They get it right before too long, but certainly not on the first try. Number 1. Heroes of Wrestling In 1999, wrestling as a whole was so ungodly popular that it made sense to try and figure out a way to tap into the craze. The pay-per-view calendar was already filled to near capacity by WWE, WCW, and ECW, but what about a nostalgia show? Cobble together some stars of the 80s and honour the past with a quaint trip down memory lane, yeah? If you've even heard of Heroes of Wrestling, you know damn well there was nothing quaint about this wretched disaster. Where do you start? With the hideous commentary of some fool named Randy Rosenblum, the Bushwhackers match against Nikolai Volkov and Iron Sheik where the wrestlers almost accidentally made contact? Whatever the match of the night was, it would have been maybe the 14th best match at WrestleMania 35, and it certainly wasn't the main event in which Jake Roberts, well, let's just say he gave a performance that was anything but unforgettable. Thanks for watching. Let us know what you think in the comments down below. You can follow us on Twitter at Cultaholic. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Cultaholic. If you enjoy what we do here at Cultaholic, you can pledge to us on Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic. And most importantly, don't forget to hit subscribe and join us.